first thing what we're going to do is everybody take your Bible and hold it up and we'll see if you remember how Pastor Paul said that we were going to start today. And if you don't have a Bible, I can tell those of you that weren't here last week. I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, so the pledge is going to be on the screen that we're going to share together. All right, let's go. I hold in my hand God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will take its words to heart and begin anew with God today. All right, thank you. So before we get into the scripture, there's a little bit of, a, of background information that I'd like to share with you that I think would be helpful uh, for our study today. So when we look at the book of Revelation, there's generally two types of people that you encounter. You have uh, those who look at the book of Revelation and they never open it. They don't want anything to do with it. They think that it's too scary, too confusing, or what have you. And then on the other hand, you have those people who want to immediately just jump into the action of the book. You know, just interpreting all of the fantastic imagery and the signs and the symbols there, such as the dragon and the beast and 144,000. But in either case, the first three chapters of Revelation, which really sets up the rest of the book, uh, kind of go unnoticed by many common readers of Revelation. But nevertheless, they are important. So as Pastor Paul touched on last week, Revelation kind of has this unique literary style. Um, it's, it doesn't really fit into one particular genre of biblical writing. It's apocalyptic and prophetic in that it has areas where it talks about um, future prophecy, um, but also prophecy refers to what God has to say to the contemporary church at the time. Really, prophets were more so foretellers than they were foretellers. So we're going to see here that it's got elements that deal with future events as well as what is going on in John's day and what he has to say to us today. But also, Revelation has another literary style in that it's a letter. John opens the letter of Revelation in the same way that other New Testament writers would write their letters. He addresses it to the churches, the seven churches that we're going to read about today. Uh, in the beginning of Revelation, in 1.4, he says, um, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. So he's addressing it to his audience. And also, he ends it. He ends the book of Revelation by saying, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Revelation 22, 21. So we'll see it as kind of this letter. But how exactly are we supposed to look at chapters 2 and 3 specifically? These are kind of mini letters. They're sometimes called the letters to the churches. Are they addressing literal churches in John's day? Or are they addressing symbolically uh, the church as a whole, churches throughout history? Well, the simple answer that we hold to here is yes, it's both. See, uh, many scholars believe that John was addressing specifically those seven churches in Asia Minor of his day. And actually, if you get out your leaflet, um, there's a handy map on page eight, you'll see. And it has the locations during the time that Revelation was written, locations of those seven churches and where they were located. And you'll see the list of the seven churches direct directly next to it. And uh, Pastor Paul mentioned this last week, but if you look at where the churches are located on the map and the order in which John lists them, he actually lists them in the order in which a postal carrier would go from town to town delivering the message. So Revelation was meant to be circulated. You see, he starts in Ephesus, goes north toward Pergamum, and then back down south toward Laodicea. So therefore, the specific issues that we'll see Jesus addressing to each church has implications beyond their immediate audience, even though he's addressing specific congregations. Well, last week we also said that the number seven is important. It's symbolic. It represents completion or wholeness. So the seven churches are symbolic of the whole church, Christ's bride. That's why we say that this section of Revelation is both literal, he's addressing literal churches, but it's also symbolic, the whole body of Christ. Well, let's, let's get into the text. On your outline, I've provided a list of the seven churches for you to take notes next to. Um, or you can feel free to use that chart in your leaflet. Now, obviously, I don't really have time to dissect each church individually, so I'm going to do kind of a, a cursory overview of each of the churches. But the first church that Jesus talks to, that he tells John to write to, is the church in Ephesus. Now, this is probably the most well-known of the seven churches, because we have an entire separate book in our Bible dedicated to them, the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. 
And essentially, Jesus is addressing these churches, and they're his evaluations of the churches. He says, uh, this is he who uh, holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven lampstands. Now, this is one of the few places, just prior to where we start in verse 2, that uh, Scripture actually reveals what these symbols represent. It says plainly that the stars represent angels, and the lampstands represent the churches. So when Jesus says he walks among the lampstands, he's saying that he's walking among the churches. He's going through them, he's addressing them specifically, and he's kind of evaluating them. So when he starts in verse 3, he says to the church in Ephesus, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and you have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So the praises for Ephesus is that they're hardworking, they're persevering, and they're uncompromising. But here's Jesus' criticism for them. Verse 4. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. See, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he actually commended them for their love. He said, I commend you for the faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. But by the time Revelation is written, we see that this church in Ephesus have lost that love, their first love for God and for others. Their faith has grown cold. Their doctrine is sound and they're doing lots of good works, but those works are not being prompted out of love for God and love for others. So what does Jesus tell them that they should do? Next verse. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. So Jesus is telling the Ephesians to repent, and if, if they don't, he's going to remove their lampstand. And if you remember, we just said the lampstand is representative of the church. So if you remove a lampstand from its place, that extinguishes the light. And in the same way, if the church does not have love, then it ceases to be an effective witness to the world. So if we want to be an effective church, we need to what? We need to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we need to love our neighbors as ourselves. Those are the two most important commandments that Jesus gives us. Moving on in uh, verse 7, Jesus addresses the Ephesians again. He says this, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now note that he uses the plural form, church is. That's indicative that even though he's addressing this particular congregation, what he has to say is meant to be shared with other churches, with other congregations, with the body of Christ as a whole. And it goes on to say, To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. So the reward here is the right to eat from the tree of life again. And that's a symbolic of a full restoration from what Adam and Eve had lost in the, the initial fall, the original sin. And this is the pattern that we're going to see throughout the rest of the churches. And it's laid out nicely in your leaflets if you're following along in there. So for each church, more or less, there's a pattern of um, a praise, a criticism, an exhortation and a reward that Jesus is going to give to each of these churches. Well, the next church that Jesus addresses is the church in Smyrna. Now, Smyrna had a strong imperial cult presence. Uh, many people there actually worshipped the emperor. So it's not surprising that Jesus reminds this church of his sovereignty. He says, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. He also sympathizes with the persecution that they're facing. And he comforts them by saying, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. The praise here for the church of Smyrna is that even though they are persecuted and impoverished physically, he calls them rich. They're spiritually rich to Christ. Now, interestingly, Smyrna is one of two churches in this list that Jesus doesn't have a, uh, anything bad to say about. The other one being Philadelphia that we'll look at later on. He simply exhorts them to remain faithful. And their reward is that they will not be harmed by the second death, which is a rabbinic term used to describe the eternal separation of God uh, in hell. So what we can take away from the example of the church of Smyrna is that if we are faithful, then we don't have to fear death in this life or the life to come. Pastor Mark Driscoll uh, puts it this way, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase it. But we as believers, this life that we live 
is as close to hell as we will ever be, Lord willing, and heaven awaits us. Amen? That is what we put our faith in. Um, one of my uh, favorite hymns is In Christ Alone. And the last verse of that hymn says, no fear in life, or I'm sorry, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. And I just love that imagery of the, the power, the real power that indwells in us through the Holy Spirit, that we don't have to fear death, physical or spiritual, if we are in Christ, if Christ is living in us. I think it's just such a beautiful image. Well, moving on to the church in Pergamum. Pergamum was the northernmost city that John is writing to. And, and Pergamum was situated at the top of this hill that was about a thousand feet high. And pagan worship was literally at its height in Pergamum. There were temples dedicated to at least four gods, as well as two Roman emperors, Augustus and Trajan. So Jesus, when he addresses the church in Pergamum, he says this, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. So he praises them for their faithfulness. But here comes the but. Verse 14. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and fight against them with the, the sword of my mouth. So, in contrast to the church in Smyrna, the church in Pergamum was being tested not so much by outright persecution, although there was some of that, but they were being tested through compromise. Their major temptation was to compromise and to give in to the culture's way of living. Does that sound familiar at all today? Now, I don't mean this to be judgmental or, or holier than thou, but when I look at the church today, particularly the church in America, I see a lot of compromise happening. And when we compromise, that, that tends to be accompanied by human justification, doesn't it? We, we tend to justify our actions, the compromises that we make, in order to minimize the guilt that we feel over them. We say, oh, well, it's all right if I don't make it to church today. I mean, can I worship God wherever I am? I listen, I listen to praise and worship music in my car. I can worship God, right? Friends, that's a compromise. See, and it's one of the easiest compromises to make, and it's one that will lead us to spiritual death. See, when we treat church, when we treat the body of Christ, the fellowship of faith, like just something that we put on our schedule, something to do, something to check off the list, I think we've missed the mark of what church is supposed to be in our lives. See, it's, it's not just about coming together and singing songs and listening to someone read scripture and, and talk about it. That's part of it. It's an important part. But church is a community of faith where we can come together as one body of believers to strengthen and encourage and lift each other up. And when we're separating ourselves from that, then we're depriving ourselves of the benefits of being in that community. And Jesus cares very much for his church. It's his bride, remember? We, you and me, we are the bride of Christ. And if church is just something that we do, just something to fit into an already overbooked schedule, and I'd say, again, we've missed the mark. Church isn't something that you do. It's something that you are. Amen? Let's look at the next church on the list. And this one's closely related to the church in Pergamum. It's the church in Thyatira. Now, Thyatira was a manufacturing and marketing hub. And again, emperor worship was strong in Thyatira. Uh, the emperor was seen as the god Apollo incarnate, and he was called the son of Zeus. And this is why Jesus reminds this church that he alone is the true son of God in verse 18. And he also praises the church for their faithfulness and their good deeds. And his criticism is very similar to his criticism of the church in Pergamum. They've tolerated teachings of false prophets, particularly that of a woman named Jezebel. Now, the original Jezebel was the wife of King Ahab in the Old Testament, and she led Israel to worship the false god Baal. This Jezebel, the one in Revelation, she's also promoting false teachings, and she's leading the church toward sexual immorality and eating food that's been sacrificed to idols. 
Jesus then encourages those who have not given in to her teaching, who have not compromised, to hold on to what they have until he returns. Again, it's a church dealing with the temptation to worship cultural idols. Now, we have all of those same idols that the church in um, Thyatira was tempted to worship. It's power, money, sex. They're all the same. They've just taken on different faces in today, today's world. It's the face of media-driven consumerism and the hypersexualization of our culture. But the temptation is still there. Well, moving on, we have the church in Sardis, whom Jesus didn't have anything commendable to say about. He said, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So here we have this picture of nominal Christianity. There are these Christians who they put on a good face, they do all the religious activities, and from the outside looking in, you'd say they're the, perf- the perfect example of what a Christian should look like. But their hearts were devoid of spiritual life. You know who else Jesus rebuked for that? The Pharisees. He called them whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. Matthew 23, 27. However, the fact that Jesus still exhorts this church and tells them to wake up and to repent is evidence that there's still hope for them. They're not so far gone that Jesus cannot revive and redeem them. And in the same way, us today, no matter where you are in your walk with Christ, you are not so far gone that he cannot redeem you, revive you, revive your spirit. How many of us today could use a revival in our own lives? Well, moving on, we have the church in Philadelphia. It's next on the list. And it's actually a reversal of the church we just looked at, the church in Sardis. Here, Jesus doesn't have a criticism for them, but he commends them for their faithfulness and their perseverance. And he promises to keep them from the hour of trial that's going to come upon the whole world. When we pray the Lord's Prayer every week, what do we say? Save us from the time of trial, right? And that exact thing that we pray for is what Jesus promises for those who remain steadfast and keep his word. Well, finally, we have the seventh church, the church in Laodicea. Now, this is probably, next to Ephesus, the most well-known church on this list due to one thing, due to the phrase that defines them. They are the lukewarm church. Now, again, Jesus has no praise for this congregation, but the criticism that he has for them has echoed in the ears of many congregations throughout the centuries, probably because it strikes a chord with so many of us. You know, we, we, we get caught up in the demands of life, of daily living. We are, we're busy, even busy with church things. And we neglect the things that matter most, which is loving God and loving others. So when we as a church fail to provide spiritual refreshment to those who are thirsty, we've lost our effectiveness. And Jesus says that he will spit us out. But we shouldn't be disheartened if the things that we're looking at today, the things that we're hearing today are tugging at our hearts, maybe starting to convict us a little bit. Because in verse 19 here, Jesus says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. So if you're feeling the Holy Spirit kind of tugging at your heart today, that's an opportunity, an opportunity to repent and to get right with God and to move forward so that you can receive the blessings that Jesus has described for those who remain faithful. Well, now flip over to the reverse side of your your insert. And uh, we're gonna look at So what's the main point of Jesus' message to all seven of these churches? Well, if you noticed, each one ends with the same phrase. Jesus says, to the one who overcomes, seven times. And each time he attaches that to a particular blessing. And that gives us a major clue as to what the major point that he's trying to make is. See, each church is challenged to overcome. That's the blank at the top of your insert. And in fact, the theme of overcoming is central to the entire book of Revelation. See, the the opening, chapters 1 through 3, is this, this setup, the challenge to overcome. And then the middle portion we get, we see the, uh, the struggle to overcome. We see the battle with the beast and the, the dragon. And then at the end, we see the reward for those who overcome. We see this picture of the new Jerusalem. And we're given the promise that those who overcome 
will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Revelation 21, 7. So how do we overcome? Well, simply put, we trust and we listen to Jesus. Also repeated seven times in these two chapters is the phrase, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. But that requires more than just listening to the words on the page. It requires taking his words to heart, like John says in Revelation 1.3, allowing scripture to transform us and to guide us on the path of righteousness. 1 John 5.5 5 gives us the requirement for victory, and it's this. He says, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? That's all we need to overcome. We need to put our faith in Jesus Christ. And when we put our faith in Christ, we share in the glory of his victory. That's the main point. That's the gospel. And that's what we cling to until Jesus returns. Amen? Amen. So I want to leave you with three things, three disciplines of an overcomer. Here they are. Prayer, penitence, and perseverance. See, we need to be in prayer and regular devotion in order to discern God's will for our lives and the life of the church. Prayer is our connection with God. John was in deep prayer. He says he was in the spirit seeking the heart of Jesus when Jesus actually showed up and revealed these things to him and told him to write them down. How awesome would it be if in your own personal prayer and devotion life, Jesus just showed up right before you, began to talk with you, minister to you? be pretty amazing. Well, penitence is just another word for repentance. Every church that Jesus has a criticism for, he instructs to repent. Repentance means to turn away from. It's an acknowledgement of our sins, but it's also asking God for forgiveness, and it's a commitment to not return to those sins. Repentance is an ongoing process of refinement. We don't earn our salvation. Jesus has already done that for us. But we continually strive to be holy as he is holy so that he will find us faithful when he returns. And finally, the third mark of an overcomer is this, perseverance. Almost every church that Jesus addresses, he either commends them for their perseverance and their faithfulness, or he encourages them to be faithful and to persevere. See, perseverance can be translated as patience but it also falls within the same semantic range as the word endure. And just like the Apostle Paul commends and, and challenges the church in Corinth to endure, he says this, run the race in such a way that you will win the prize. And what is the prize that we seek? What's the promises of God, the everlasting God, who was and who is and who is to come? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your words of life, the words that just reach within and speak throughout history to each, the churches that um, John was writing to in his day and even the churches of today. So Lord, we pray that every one of us would take these words to heart, that we would, our spirits would be stirred to recommit to you where we need to, the areas of our lives, to repent where we need to, so that we may be found faithful when you return. Lord, we pray that as we go this week and throughout the ins and outs of our daily life, that we would be a city on a hill, a light to the world, that you would not remove our lampstands, but that we would shine brightly. And as always, Lord, we pray, come quickly in your name. Amen. Let's stand and let's praise together.